I'm Judy Stiles. Thank you for joining us this week on Newsmakers. Well, in late December, our area experienced flooding and heavy rains and a lot of damage throughout the region. One park and one conservation area in particular, the Wildcat Glades Conservation and Audubon Center. Joining me today, Chris Pistol with the center, and I'd like to thank you very much for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, we've heard a lot about the effects of the flood, and today I want to focus on not only the flood, but the after effects and the rebuilding and what's going through. But uh, kind of refresh our minds, in late December, we had a couple of days of record-breaking floods. Yeah. Um, anyone from this area probably remembers that it was the day after Christmas that it all started, so on December 26th. And over a two to three day period there, we received over 10 inches of rain in some places, um, which is an enormous amount of precipitation and with nowhere really for it to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so Shoal Creek, which is a major waterway here in, in Southwest Missouri, the third largest tributary of Spring River, and Joplin's main water source, it experienced the record um, flood event. So previously the high had been about 18 feet, almost 19 feet, and we peaked out during this flood at 23.4 feet. So it broke the record, not by just a little bit. It, really it, it was pretty it. significant. And of course, your center is located on the creek, literally. In the park, the Wildcat Glades area, you are, your part of your system is that creek. Yeah, the Wildcat Park is nice because it's very diverse in its habitat. So where the center is actually located, fortunately, is up on high ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's at the edge of the Chert Glade, which gives it its name, the Wildcat, Wildcat Glades. Mm -hmm. But but we also have a considerable amount of area that is down in what would be considered a bottomland. It's the floodplain, right. and that's where a lot of the trails are. So uh, it's nice because we do get a diversity of plant and animal life there, and most of the trails are concentrated in that bottomland area. And it's actually um, cities and, and institutions all over the country are finding that that's a good use for a lot of that land. As we know, they are naturally flood prone. Mm -hmm. And so putting buildings down there there runs a great risk and flooding events have gotten more severe over the last few decades and uh, scientists uh, believe that a lot of that is due to climate change. Um, you put more moisture in the atmosphere, you're going to get these very heavy rain events. It's going to come back like down. Right? Yeah, what right. goes up must come down. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, our, our trails experience probably the, the greatest damage. Well, I know people have seen some pictures, but you have some photos, and we'll start off perhaps by showing some photos that you have, and uh, people recognize the park and they recognize the bridge. I think that's one of the pictures we'll have to start off as we're talking about. And when you look at a bridge and how high the water is, I mean, that really shows you usually those arches are well above the water level. Absolutely, yes. And you can see the nice uh, riffle area, the, or some people call them rapids, mm -hmm. uh, on the left side of the bridge there. So that is, of course, the old Reddings Mill Bridge that you're looking at, and that is part of the trail system. That, that's one of our trailheads. So there's a parking area right there uh, and people can access the trail system from, from right there at Reddings Mill Bridge. But yeah, we were very lucky this year. We didn't have any major um, structures that broke loose and floated down. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was in 2011 maybe or uh, prior to that, one of the large floods, we had actually a septic tank that burst up from underground and floated downstream and ended up lodging right there next to the bridge. And that was quite an undertaking to get a crane out there mm -hmm. that could lift that septic tank out. A lot of it. debris afterwards after that water goes down, you have that high level of water. Yes, uh -huh, a lot of trees um, mm -hmm. that washed down. Fortunately, we noticed there was not a lot of litter. Mm -hmm. We were kind of surprised um, along the trails there in the park that, that there wasn't a great amount of litter. Well, that fast rate just kept everything going, really. Maybe that that time to yeah. on you. But the photo that we showed earlier, uh, that is uh, tying into part of your efforts to rebuild. Tell a little bit of the story about that photo and the bridge. Yeah, well, we have all kinds of volunteers that help us with the Audubon Center. Um, I tell everyone that to be a volunteer, there's only two prerequisites. One, you like nature, mm -hmm. and two, you like people. <laughs> yes. um, and even that one's a little bit iffy because uh, we have some jobs that don't require you to be around a lot of people uh, where you can go out and work on the trail system, for example, or, or helping with doing some maintenance. But you do have to love nature. And so one of our volunteers, uh, his name is Russ Kinnerson. Uh, he's an excellent photographer, actually helps uh, teach a couple of classes mm -hmm. on photography, nature photography at the center. And he took that image, he captured that image during the height of the flood. 
And Reddings Mill Bridge is pretty special to a lot of people in this area. They, it's been History. there for a very long time. They've grown up with it. It's, it's like an icon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was actually his idea that perhaps we could um, make that available for a, a fee and the, don the money would go then to help the Audubon right. Center rebuild the trail system and, and the other damage that was done. So sales of the prints of that picture then are going to help you out. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that was also worked out with uh, Print House Fine Art in mm -hmm. Carthage. Mm -hmm. And so we appreciate them working with us as well. But uh, yeah, people can actually go on our website and uh, there's a, a link there that they can click on and, uh, and it will take them to that, that site where they can find out more information. The prints available in, in a number of different sizes, oh, yeah. uh, different finishes as mm -hmm. well. So um, if Reading Small Bridge is near and dear to your heart, it, it's something you could have a piece of history right there, forever yeah, captured. Historic bridge and historic flood, <laughs> yes. tying that together. Now the damage itself, you mentioned the trails and the damage. I know you had some, also some pictures of, uh, showing the trails. They were not just a dirt trail. You had nice paved asphalt trails. Yes, uh, you know, it's important. We want the trails to be accessible to, to all different kinds of people. And mm -hmm. so um, part of the trail system was uh, covered with asphalt. And uh, that was um, uh, accessible then to people with disabilities, right. wheelchair accessible as well. And it made a nice loop. We called it the Woodland Loop Trail. And it did come very close there to Shoal Creek. But um, it wasn't this close originally. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're seeing there, probably about, um, I'd say, 10 to 20 yards of soil washed away that was on the right side uh, here in the picture of the trail. So the uh, rushing water washed away the shoreline basically. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just it, uh, removed a tremendous amount of soil and mm -hmm. some of that was deposited on the trails as you see here. Right. Um, a lot of rock, um, the river rock uh, and other debris completely covered some of the trails. In some places that debris is up to about three feet in depth. Mm. So we're going to have a work day and we're going to try removing some of that rock and put right. it to good use in other areas where it washed out and left gullies but it, it really did a tremendous amount of damage and uh, we get so many people we we have about I think last year 35,000 visitors that came out and walked the trails mm -hmm. and so we quickly jumped in and and got that open as as quickly as we could we had to make an alternate path um, and again it was thanks to a, a a volunteer, just a community member who stepped up. We, we don't have a lot of equipment, heavy equipment mm -hmm. to do that work. And he came forward and said, hey, I'll bring out my tractor and, and uh, a bucket and, and I can help you get this open again. Kind of so cut a new way to go around in that trail. We so did. Much. So mm -hmm. yes, we have a new path. Now I know you also had sign and signage and so forth along the trail. I imagine that went downstream as well. Yes. Uh, it's kind of amazing, kind of like with tornadoes, as you go and survey the, the damage of what was removed but what stayed, mm -hmm. some things really surprise you that, that did survive okay. And what we noticed was that if um, an object was sheltered by a large standing tree, oh. well, that, that uh, you know, helped break the flow mm -hmm. and also any debris, other trees washing down uh, from colliding with it. So we learned a, a valuable lesson to put some of those signs and, and other objects. Put it next to a tree so it's protected. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we did have some signs that were lost, some mm -hmm. posting cabling in certain areas. Um, we also had a kiosk that washed oh, away. Mm -hmm. um, it was just sheared off at the ground level. So it must have been a pretty large tree that came Smashed along it and, it came and along. took it out. We lost our picnic tables in the gazebo. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, all total, we've estimated about $50,000 in damages, uh, what it would cost to replace everything. Right. So the first step of rebuilding, replacing, is going out there in the hands-on work on the workday that you mentioned. So, But you have that $50,000 challenge of replacing the physical items, the gazebo and the particular Right, so yes, exactly. And so um, in addition, you know, being a um, nature area, people are probably curious as far as the effects on nature with that flooding. You know, the, yeah. you know you've changed the landscape. You've <laughs> obviously affected <laughs> what's happening there. We have gotten a number of questions. You know, well, what will, how will this affect the wildlife, um, the, the landscape there? And the good thing is that for the most part, nature is very resilient. And as I said before, this area is a natural floodplain. Okay. So periodically it experiences these floods. And, you know, when we have structures 
uh, that we have an interest in, well, we, we don't like the floods, but from a very natural perspective, uh, floods can actually be a good thing mm. um, because uh, how those floodplains developed was the, these uh, fairly regular flood events that deposited a lot of sediment. And that sediment is then going to be very rich, full of nutrients, and wonderful for the plants that like to grow there. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I was saying, some of the, the area there, especially on the Woodland Loop Trail, did get buried under, in some cases, feet of um, mostly river rock and, and other debris. So, um, you know, succession is this natural progression uh, from almost a, a bare state to the, the climax stage. Um, like say a mature forest. Right. So um, you know nature's pretty adept at, at uh, dealing with these changes. Uh, has done so since the beginning of time. <laughs> Earth, right. <laughs> and as far as when it comes to the animals and yeah. so forth, I'm sure they know how to flee floods. I mean they obviously can there's a lot of people who critters were living in that area. Yeah, I, I, I kind of wondered about, you know, if there were mammals that were hibernating, mm -hmm. um, you know, probably not the best location to pick a floodplain to, to <laughs> hibernate in just in case. But, you know, I, I imagine some of those uh, may not have, have uh, survived. Also some reptiles maybe mm -hmm. that were um, in the process of hibernating because it was in, in winter. Right. The water but, wasn't low like it was supposed to be and it was able yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, some of the greatest damage as far as wildlife goes might actually be in the stream itself mm. because Shoal Creek is home to um, at least one federally endangered species and that's the, called the Neosho Mucket Mussel. So it's a small uh, mussel right. or clam, clam as many people, people would shells, call them. Right? <laughs> And uh, they have declined greatly over much of their range, um, but they still survive in Shoal Creek. And so if they were buried by a lot of that sediment that eroded mm -hmm. uh, due to the, the flood, then uh, they, they may have suffered a, a pretty significant loss. And we just, we don't know. It's very hard to survey but, them and find out how many there are. Mm -hmm. um, although they have attempted to do that in the past, uh, yeah. folks from the, the state uh, fish and wildlife agencies. To check up on how many there are. Now, of course, Audubon, people think of birds. Uh, you know, I was, winter time, probably you didn't have a lot of birds in the area actively nesting at the time, but well, how does this affect the bird population? Right, yeah, nothing would be nesting. Um, we do have some species that actually come visit us only for the winter. Mm -hmm. um, primarily, uh, they're from up farther north, um, Arctic regions, um, uh, Canada, and so they have found that coming down here is a good place to spend the, the, the winter. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot better than being in Canada <laughs> for the winter. Um, but, you know, with the birds, they can easily flee those those uh, areas that are impacted directly by the, by mm -hmm. the flooding. Um, we get bald eagles, of course, right. primarily in, in Missouri in the winter. Um, Missouri has one of the largest wintering populations of bald eagles in the state, but you know, for the most part, it, it wouldn't affect them. Um, but what it did do is it also eliminated a lot of birdhouses. And uh, I actually have yeah, one, of, it's the one of the things people come to the center here. and notice the birdhouses. So this is an example. Of yes. That. So we have a number of these that we've put up um, along the trails. And primarily they're in the, the riparian woodland area and mm -hmm. that woodland loop trail. Mm -hmm. Those are specifically for a bird that has declined greatly and they're one of our species of conservation interest. Um, that is called the prothonotary warbler. And so they're this um, just almost brilliant golden yellow colored bird. Uh, they're sometimes called the golden swamp candle mm. um, because of their coloration. And they're only here during the summer months. So they um, migrate to the north in the summertime. Well, actually, yeah, they're here in the it's summertime. In the summer, right. So and then in the winter, they go down to Central and okay. South America. So they have quite a journey to yes, come back Yes, they here. do. Right. And so... And we have a picture. This yeah. is an example of what one of the birds looks like. Yes, um, and using one of the boxes that we had up there. Mm -hmm. So for about the last three years, we've been monitoring the boxes. We had about 23 of those up in the park. And um, the majority of those were washed away in the flood. Mm. Okay. So fortunately, the biology club here at Missouri Southern, they have um, agreed that they're going to help rebuild mm. those wooden boxes and, and get them put back up, hopefully in places where they'll be a little more secure next time, closer to those trees. <laughs> right, for the sheriff's lane. We can see the bird as well. It's a very a colorful sight that people, you know, really would oh, love yeah. to watch and see they're, those birds. They're just amazing. And uh, one of the uh, faculty from the biology department, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Karen Plusinski, last summer, she was our main monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, she went out uh, 
um, at least once a week, sometimes twice a week, and help to check the boxes, uh, all 23 of them. Wow. And uh, we had only about 10 young that were raised last summer. And once again, it was due to flooding. Mm. <laughs> we had, if, if probably lots of people don't remember, but uh, we had a flood in, uh, I believe it was late June or early July. A lot of rain in the summer. A lot of rain. Um, yeah, it was strange last summer. It was very cool and wet mm -hmm. in the early part of the summer. And uh, there was a, another um, high water event. And so twice, not once, but twice, some of our boxes got underwater. But again, that's something that the, this species has adapted to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's mortality uh, caused. Um, they normally nest in old woodpecker holes in hollow trees. They go to a tree, so you're giving yeah. them an artificial site. Yeah, too. <laughs> and we, we put them as high as we can, but still mm -hmm. be able to easily access them and check them. So um, we did lose a few nests last summer due to that when the birds were there nesting. Now people who are watching might have some questions about the box and its structure. Someone might be saying, well, why is that wire on the front? Yeah. You know, just for the layman's terms, you know, why the design and the type of box? You yeah, this, uh, this guard here is called a predator guard. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it does basically is it keeps predators, especially uh, things like raccoons, maybe possums, that are able to climb up the pole that these are mounted on. They're not mounted on the tree. Okay. Um, um, that puts the birds inside at a greater risk. Mm -hmm. So they're actually mounted on a, a metal pole, a piece of conduit pipe, about uh, five, five and a half feet high. And so if those raccoons or uh, opossums, they climb up there, they try to reach into the box, but this projects out far enough. So they can't it, reach in there and grab eggs or grab the little or anything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And usually they're not able to get down inside here. They're, mm -hmm. they're usually too big for that. So yeah, it, it protects the, the adults and the young and the eggs that are inside the box. And uh, of course, how we check them is uh, we have to be able to, to open them up. Right. How do you look inside to see if anybody's taken them? Right. And, so, uh, and, and it's important to be able to clean them out too. These mm -hmm. little birds, these prothonotary warblers, they have a tendency, they love to fill them up to the top, oh. and, and that's in the first nesting. So <laughs> They put a lot of effort into that nest. Yeah, after each nesting, we go out and we remove the, the nest. But oh, there's an example. Yeah, I actually have um, a nest, an old nest here, uh, lots of moss mm -hmm. and uh, other material that the birds pick up. And so, um, yeah, last year, like I said, 10 young that we produced. In the previous years, we had closer to 20 mm -hmm. produced. And so last year was just, just not a, Down as good a year. Down because of the conditions last year. So what are your goals as far as replacing these boxes? The timetable. You know, these birds are obviously south now. When mm -hmm. do you, how much time do you have before they're going to start mm -hmm. heading up this way? They'll, they'll return to our area in April, probably not before mid-April. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we definitely want to have the boxes all ready. Um, the males are usually some of the first to arrive, and they establish their territories. They often will start building nests. And then the females arrive shortly after that, the females and juveniles from the previous year. Mm -hmm. And um, they'll quickly pair up. And uh, the female actually decides which, which site suits her needs the best. <laughs> okay. And she will oftentimes then go ahead and, and finish out building the nest, you know, mm -hmm. make it to her specifications. <laughs> now, it was such a bright yellow bird. Is the female similar to the male, or is there a differentiation between those? They look very, very similar. Yeah, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's, it's hard to tell the difference. It, so when you're monitoring like the cardinal. boxes, right? <laughs> it makes it more of a challenge for people monitoring. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. So that's something that you're working with the biology club and rebuilding and getting those back in place. Yes. we actually this is a, a project uh, we abbreviate we call the prothonotary a prow mm -hmm. p-r-o-w for short so we call this the prow project okay. and we actually have been working with uh, audubon centers throughout the country um, down in louisiana in south carolina these birds primarily like swamps so mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of in marginal habitat for them but along the creeks and rivers here in southern missouri um, they definitely make this their home as well but you typically associate them more with a, a bottomland swamp. And so there's a project where very little is, is still known about uh, their migratory paths um, and their full life cycle. Mm -hmm. And so it's really neat and we're excited to be involved in this project 
Eventually, we hope to be able to put some geolocators. So these are little computer devices, tracking devices, that actually are small enough that they fit on the bird. So we're kind of almost banding them with a little... <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's uh, got a little harness that goes mm -hmm. on them. Okay. And uh, and then when those birds return, those ge they can be recaught and the geolocator removed from them and then the data downloaded. And what it does is it reads their location um, based on uh, a GPS. And so we'll know a lot more and we'll be able to participate in this. This uh, Actually, it's an international study oh. because these birds are international. All over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, going all the way down to Central and, and South America. So we hope that in the next year or so, we'll be able to um, get a bander, a bird bander, that will help us by being able to, to band those birds. And we'll be able to gather a lot of information about them. So here in Southwest Missouri, we're a small piece of the big puzzle <laughs> yes. tying that together and how yes. what happens. Uh, you talked about education and efforts. I understand you also have a grant that talking about geolocation and ge you know that type of thing. Tell me about this yeah. grant that you have that's going to help in addition to another um, tie. Mm -hmm. And it ties right in with the the Prothonotary Warbler Project. Mm -hmm. So um, actually, a couple of years ago, you know, in the grant world, uh, things move quite slowly. Right. Take, you got to write. You have to propose it. Right. Yeah. I, I think we wrote the grant in. Um, 2014 and we didn't find out that we got the grant until six months or eight months later mm. and so it began um, actually last fall and it runs for a year and it's through IMLS which stands for the Institute for Museum and Library Services and when we started out writing this grant with some other folks from uh, the National Audubon um, headquarters we didn't realize how difficult it was, what we were really biting off. Um, lots of people had tried from the Nature Center world, mm -hmm. and primarily they fund museums and libraries. Right. Um, and this is a, a federal agency, so um, we were very pleased and, and thrilled when, uh, surprised you might even say, when we learned that we were accepted, mm -hmm. that our proposal was chosen. So what this grant is basically doing, we're tying it into uh, the Joplin School District as well, mm -hmm. and um, we have worked with them. We've gotten some tablets, and so with these devices now that can go in the field, they will help students be able to gather data from the field, real scientific data, and we feel like that's important in our education process. Mm -hmm that we're not just putting the students through an exercise for, for no real reason, but that they're really gathering true scientific data that it's can be go useful. on to be, be used by someone else, right? Yes, mm -hmm. and so um, the seventh graders from all the Joplin schools, they will be invited to participate and come out to the center this spring and we tie it into their curriculum and especially with their um, their focus on water mm -hmm. and aquatic ecosystems right. and so not only will they be doing some sampling some testing of the water like we see here with some nets uh, mostly right. they're looking for macroinvertebrates and the macroinvertebrates these small bugs if you will um, <laughs> not all of them are actual bugs <laughs> right. but they're the he's got a crayfish <laughs> yes though so they're an invertebrate but a lot of invertebrates are very sensitive to pollution and so mm -hmm. by doing a, a a, a very simple and easy survey of the invertebrates present, we get a good indication of the water quality there. How healthy is that river, that creek you're dealing yes. with? Mm -hmm. But that ties back into the prothonotary warbler, partly because prothonotary warblers feed quite a bit on some of the adult stages mm -hmm. of these macroinvertebrates. For example, mayflies, mm -hmm. um, the larva, the young mayflies uh, live in, in the water itself. But the adults, they emerge with wings, and they're a large part of the prothonotary's diet. So while they're flying around, the birds are getting them, so they need yeah. them. Yeah, right? so it's all connected, <laughs> as they say. Right. <laughs> and uh, so we'll also have the students now this year, and with those tablets, and using a software program produced by a company called Esri. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, ArcGIS Online. Oh. So it is mapping software, and so the students will be um, tracking some of the prothonotary warblers and the nest boxes and probably some of the vegetation cover around the nest boxes, 
and uh, we'll be able to have them make these maps, and uh, which also fits into the curriculum there with the schools. So they're learning a lot of things on the hands-on application through the process of what you yes, have out there. Yes, yeah. Okay. This, this is a GIS, Geographic Information Systems. Mm -hmm. It's a, a cutting-edge technology um, that um, most scientists now are familiar with, especially uh, anyone doing uh, field biology. Um, it's a great way to um, map areas where your, your species of interest is located or to monitor changes in the landscape, the habitat. So I, I'm really excited to get this going this spring with the students and see how they react to it. And I know we hear a lot about encouraging students to the love of science, exploring it in the future. It sounds like there's a lot of possibilities that maybe spark yeah. an interest in one of those youngsters to say, I like this, you know, I want to keep doing so. this. I hope so. That would definitely be, make it all worthwhile. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we're trying to put more of an emphasis on the technology and what, of course, is known as STEM learning. Right. So the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics where, you know, historically we've kind of been lagging behind a lot of the other countries in the world mm -hmm. in how our students um, achieve in that area. And, you know, they're there are future scientists, and we need we, <laughs> we need, need them those young. people. Yeah, right. Tying that together, so yeah, it's it's making it interesting and and fun at the same time right. for them. Well, I know you have a lot of ongoing education efforts, whether it's the school coming in and just the programs at your center. You have a website that uh, has all this information available. I want to make sure we mention that yeah. for the viewers, that the people can go to your website and find out when your workshops are going to be, when you're going to have things coming up. Yes, and I have to say that even before our recent upgrade, we, we last fall we got uh, our revamped website up and running. Mm -hmm. And even before that, though, our website was actually one of the best of all the Audubon centers mm -hmm. throughout the country. Country. We had worked really hard on that and kind of broke the mold in some respects of telling them, you know, this is what we really think it should be able to do. And so we were allowed the leeway to, to kind of venture out there and, and be cutting edge. Set the pace for others. Right? Yeah, but it did need to be refreshed um, and it's, it is better. It's mm -hmm. new and improved and uh, the, as is the National Audubon website. So there's a lot of information there. You can go, if, if you just want to know what bird you're seeing in your yard, they have a great um, tab there that you can click on and you can find all different kinds of birds. Identify those area. birds that you've seen. Yes, what? and we've also done that with a number of birds uh, here on our website that are local to our area. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, the programs, lots of information there people can find about upcoming programs. The one thing that we don't have that we were kind of disappointed in that we, that we had before was a way for people to register online. So if I want to go to next Saturday's workshop, I still need to pick up the phone and call you. And make yes, a yes. <laughs> call us. You can send us an email. Okay. You can say I want to be signed up but we no longer have that capability online where you can fill out all your information on a form. And, and how do they call you? What's your phone number for people who are watching? That would be important. Yes, <laughs> it's 417-782-6287. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, sometimes we kind of get in this mode of thinking just Southwest Missouri, but we have people from all over the four state region, region right. that come to our, our programs and we th that's why we're here. That's mm -hmm. what it's all about. We, we're not just a Joplin thing. Um, we are for schools and, and groups and organizations from uh, all over. We consider our core area about um, a 60 mile radius from Joplin. So that covers quite a bit quite of the a four bit states. In different states as well, right. So are people um, watching, if they've tuned in late, we want to let them know that A, you're open for business. Even though you suffered this damage, your center's still open, the trails revised a little bit, but they're still open. Come out and enjoy even in the winter time, there's things to do. Absolutely. I tell people that the winter is a great time to get outdoors because if you, if you don't like mosquitoes, and, <laughs> and I don't know anyone who does, mm -hmm. <laughs> you do, if you don't like ticks, you don't like poison ivy, um, winter, you don't have to worry about those things. Sure. So it's a great time to be out and enjoy nature. And everything just looks very different. Sure. Enjoy the seasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Chris, I'd like to thank you very much for visiting with us today on the show. Thank, thank you. you again for having us. You're welcome. And I'd like to thank you, the viewers, for joining us this week. I'm Judy Stiles. Hope you can join me again next week at the same time on the station. We'll see you then.